Hi and good evening. My name is Ulla Jones and I'll be moderating today's event. Welcome to uh, the Glocal uh, SDN event. We are um, the second in a row of these wonderful events. And uh, to uh, kick things off, we have um, the chapter lead from Helsinki or from Finland um, um, here to sort of welcome us all in. So stage is yours, Teja. <laughs> Thank you, Ulla. Uh, very warm welcome from my behalf as well to everyone. Um, as Ulla mentioned, this is the second Service Design Network's uh, global meetup. Uh, we had a global meetup in the US before. Uh, now, now we are following second and, and there will be uh, the, the third one in Asia later on. So um, very excited to be here. This is uh, kind of a new concept for a service design network. And uh, this concept of like new like members meet up, uh, bringing together service designers from different countries, uh, maybe those time zones that are closer to each other and uh, well, sharing knowledge as we are doing here tonight. Um, Tonight's uh, event is organized by the uh, SDN Finland and Norway. Uh, we have a big bunch of people behind this event and maybe everyone could sort of give a wave. Uh, and I tried to find, find everyone's, everyone's name, but from Finland we have Ulla and Lotta and uh, Elisa Terotaria, Rika here. And uh, from, from Norway, we have Ule and Lantnil and, um, and uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> and, and Ule to, um, who have been organizing this event. So, um, so nice uh, to be here today. And uh, maybe we can jump ahead to the next slide and uh, about this tonight's tea. Uh, tonight we are talking about designing for people, not stereotypes. Uh, such an important theme. This has been, I don't know, out and about quite some time and uh, in, in different design forums. And uh, we are very happy to welcome our speakers tonight and, and bring their insights of this topic. Um, the big theme here is sort of we, how we came to this was uh, true sustainability as a sort of like a uh, overarching theme, and it was very interesting to find uh, these 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 uh, different cases from these two countries, and uh, it's such such an interesting to hear what our speakers have have to say. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> Deja, that's that's Deja. Yeah, uh, thank you, Deja. So you know what? Why don't we get going? We have yeah. uh, two amazing presentations, and we have plenty of time around these uh, presentations to also answer questions and so forth. So what I suggest we do is um, we have the. I suppose in, in our what we call the Norway team jo show, join us at the moment. However, really uh, uh, to sort of clarify, this was this was a collaboration between the Finland chapter and the Norway chapter. But really, our speakers uh, represent much more wider uh, range of, of specialists. We have speakers from uh, UK and and we have uh, people uh, speakers uh, from Italian background. I didn't ask where you were from. You get to tell that yourself. So that's why I'm not pinpointing you to any country at this very moment. However, um, we would like to keep this very sort of uh, uh, conversational. But uh, while, while the speakers are presenting, uh, I'll ask you to uh, write down your questions in the chat. We'll be uh, 
sort of um, pointing out good, uh, interesting questions along the way of, of the talk. And then afterwards, we've also reserved time uh, for a, a, a short Q&A session. In addition to the last half an hour of our event is also going to be about sort of deep dive into these topics and you get to ask specific questions from specific speakers and so forth. So all in all, we're here together for um, well, it's now six past six evening in Finland. Uh, it might be uh, six past four in the UK or five past, um, I'm six past five uh, in the Central Europe. But for the next one and a half hours, uh, we'll be together and uh, discussing this topic of sort of a, of uh, not, not designing for pe uh, just uh, stereotypes, but designing for people. So won't you guys uh, just start your presentation? Uh, we have um, Chiara Lino, we have uh, Julia Bacioli, we have Charlie Weilerman, and we have Katie Weiberg uh, um, presenting. And I probably did uh, injustice to some of your names, especially I, I recognize Charlie's name. Apologies. Please repeat your names once you uh, present yourselves. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ulla. And maybe I think uh, Julia and I are going to start. So I will uh, quickly share my screen. If there's uh, uh, any problem with uh, seeing it, let me know. So hello, everyone, and thanks again for having us. Uh, my name, like you pronounced uh, perfectly, is Chiara Lino. And I'm Julia Bazzoli. We both work at Design It in the Oslo studio, even though we're both Italian and from Italy, uh, living in Oslo at the moment. And we're both uh, uh, lead UX designers uh, at uh, Design It. And like we have quite varied backgrounds, the both of us, we have worked all across uh, this huge discipline that is uh, UX and several different projects also together. Uh, we lean more towards the research side of it, uh, but we are uh, in approaching research quite keen on making it as approachable and actionable as possible. And just uh, a quick overview of what we, uh, when we talk about research, we are uh, like including all the different ways uh, both uh, internal and external to the organization uh, that we use to uh, collect uh, information and data, analyze it, synthesize it, um, and like just really integrating both different data points and methodologies, uh, including, uh, I don't know, anything spanning from the classic or for us designers, classic contextual interviews, but also including desk research, future trends, uh, testing of concepts and prototypes, metrics uh, and other sources of quantitative data and so on. And because research is so uh, complex, we always need or we find ourselves at a moment where we need to simplify it uh, in order to make it actionable um, and extract what is uh, what is relevant from uh, from the from the information that we have at hand. So the way that we exercise what we can really define <laughs> the power of simplifying uh, and extracting these findings is crucial for uh, arriving to an inclusive output, uh, which could be product service, anything really. Uh, and that's how we landed on uh, making mindsets, which is the uh, approach uh, that we are going to introduce to you today. So as a quick and yet quite complex definition, mindsets is an approach that frames the spectrum of attitudes and emotional responses that different people have within the same context or life experience. So if you think of any experience, uh, big experience in our lives, we can uh, like, we go through it 
And even if we come from different walk of lives, we could be grouped by the same uh, mindsets or approach or attitudes or behaviors that we have in a specific context. That doesn't necessarily define us as a person though, it's just how we approach that specific arena. Um, and just as a like a quite important but side point to that, uh, there are different uh, tools and approaches that are called mindsets. Mindset in itself is a kind of an English word. So uh, like what we're talking about is something that Julia and I made together. Uh, but uh, if you Google mindsets, it could come up different things also related to design. So uh, we will share some resources at the end uh, that are like exactly what we're talking about specifically. Uh, yes. So going back to what mindsets are, uh, basically for each project or initiative that addresses a specific experience and needs to uh, under get into an understanding uh, of users uh, for, for reaching a specific outcome, we would develop a set of mindsets. So quickly we can look into, we have very little time, so I'm rushing through it, I'm really sorry. Uh, really quickly, let's look into what compose, uh, composes uh, a mindset. Uh, first of all, like how, uh, like name and uh, image. As designers, we know how much visual representation is important to anchor uh, content and make it really memorable. Uh, so, uh, but we don't want to focus on the individual, on a specific person when illustrating a mindset, because that could lead to bias and stereotypes, right? And it really shows how, like, what we associate to a specific uh, emotional state. Uh, so we decide to focus on the context in a way that uh, pictures uh, how the context uh, that we're uh, going through in a specific experience, uh, how do we perceive it? How does it make us feel? And the relationship between uh, the individual that is um, shown as a white silhouette uh, that is like really um, on the side uh, of this, allowing whomever is interacting with mindsets to project themselves and really focus on how this person might be experiencing the surrounding surroundings and uh and then the instead of a name uh, or a noun that indicates a specific uh mindset we decided to refer to it with a title that could be more evocative like a phrase uh, for example we have used mindsets for uh, a project around the uh, journey towards home ownership, so uh, the process of buying a home. And we have referred uh, to, like, within the set of mindsets that we have developed, the ones that were more kind of insecure or uncertain or uh, lacked a specific uh, financial education, references, or support, we have uh, named Lost in the Woods. And then each mindset is uh, lists a series of examples of what are some different life situations that could uh, fit that mindset or like what uh, that, that mindset might fit. Uh, so uh, for example, if we think about another type of project like around working from home, I'm sure we can all empathize with that. Uh, we can also see how people in very different life situations and like uh, with different, uh, very different type of homes might be experiencing the same uh, emotional and practical impact in their day to day. And then we really focus on transformation and potential. We want to embed in each mindset how that mindset can grow and evolve. Uh, as an example, if uh, when focusing on the future of traveling, um, how might experienced traveler change their habits and perspectives after this pandemic that we're in? Uh, what is the context that they will grow and evolve within? Uh, so it's really important for us to uh, like include this dynamic in how we talk about our users.
Yes. We actually have a question and I was wondering if you could just sort of uh, uh, sort of uh, elaborate maybe tiny bit since we have those few extra minutes is that there was a we question uh, okay. uh, that we uh, that would you use uh, a mindset like lost in the woods in a place of a persona or <laughs> uh, yes and no. Uh, I mean, you, you, you just said that we have some extra minutes, but I think this question deserves a couple of hours. <laughs> um, just um, full disclosure, uh, mindsets were absolutely uh, initially developed as a response to uh, a re direct request for personas. We didn't want to use personas for several reasons. Uh, we can get into that. Let's see how many minutes we have left yeah. at the end. Um, but uh, I would, I would never say that uh, we could replace a mind, a persona with a mindset. It doesn't go this direct one to one. Uh, what I could say is that the research that we do uh, that would, uh, that could lead to personas could be used to develop mindsets and then. Uh, frame it in a way that goes more across different like persona type uh, but focuses more on how we experience uh, certain uh, experiences. Thank you. I think that's the, all the time we have because we do uh, it's uh, we have about 13 minutes of the presentation totally uh, be total before we move to the next topic so we'll we'll touch those questions a little later on. Yeah. I just don't see the next slide. That's yeah, why I'm not I will, continuing. Uh, I will step on it. <laughs> That's all. Yes, can but I can. I don't see it. No, I, on my side. But maybe if people see mindset anatomy slash two. No, no, it no, hasn't okay. matched. No. Okay. Um, I have no idea how to fix that. I will uh, stop sharing and reshare. Perfect. Ah, it's the Rip Zoom life. Fence. Always, <laughs> no always a surprise. Technology failing. Yes, now I see it. Cool. Perfect. Okay, so just to um, so if if Chiara showed you like four of the main um, kind of um, components that we see as intrinsic part of uh, mindsets, we still wanted to show you a couple of others that we don't necessarily believe that are as intrinsic, but we wanted to show how mindsets can be flexible according to your project. And these are relationship with the institution and uh, UX guidelines. And with relationship with the institution, we mean the role that the institution needs to have towards their users and how that might vary um, relating to each mindset. Though, um, depending on the project, there might be multiple players um, uh, to keep into consideration. Uh, so for example, if we think about healthcare, so in this specific context, it's less about one org or one institution, but more about mapping the overall ecosystem and how the players uh, interrelate with each other. Uh, in terms of um, UX guidelines, um, by that we mean principles and concrete uh, directions around uh, you know, features, interactions, uh, copy to make sure that all different mindsets are supported uh, throughout the digital service. So, and in fact, for us, designing inclusively doesn't mean that we are making one thing for all people, but we are designing a diversity of ways for everyone to be able to participate and create a sense of belonging. Uh, but again, the need of uh, having specifically UX guidelines varies from project to project. And if we move on the next slide, um, I'm sure that at this point you would expect uh, a, uh, a slide showing a process, the process we follow to make um, mindsets. But there isn't one, um, because there isn't necessarily one way to create mindsets. Uh, and this is because we don't want to be prescri prescriptive about how to make them step by step. 
though um, we do have some important aspects um, that we think they're important uh, to, um, to keep in mind if you are in a project that might benefit um, from using mindsets. Uh, started with recruiting diversely. And recruitment is the most undervalued step of the design process, but actually it's the most impacting because if you don't involve different voices and perspectives from the start, it will be more difficult to make, uh, to create an inclusive solution. And inclusive, inclusivity cannot be an afterthought. Uh, collecting data from different sources, as Chiara was saying in the, uh, before, uh, we need a diversity of methods to triangulate our data, uh, which could be not only user research, but also desk research, future trends, uh, even customer service logs. Uh, but of course, in this triangulation, it's important to include abundant qualitative data in the mix. And then mindsets frame the fluidity and complexity of people's experiences. Um, I think that sometimes with designers, we tend to oversimplify our users or we use tools that push us towards that oversimplification. Um, but we know that as people, we are not, we are not static. We keep on evolving. Um, we change over time as much as we change when we go through uh, a specific experience. Uh, so we need to capture that. And finally, mindset does not combat biases in itself. Uh, it helps limiting their effect. But for us, it's very important to underline how reducing bias is a continuous work that we need to do not only on our craft, but also on ourselves as designers and as people. And there, there's really no tool that can be crafted to compensate for that. And mindset is, is not the one tool that will give you all the answer that you need or you need to use in every single project. Um, it certainly, it shouldn't be used in isolation, but it's best when it's paired alongside other tools like jobs to be done or user scenarios. And if we go to the next slide, um, and if there isn't a tool that captures what we are trying to do, then let's invent one. Um, because it's important that as designers, we challenge and reframe how we do things. And this is how Kiara and I call the design in design, which can sound a bit meta, a bit it is, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, but it, it's, it's really like besides the meta design in design, but it's really about approaching our tools critically and not treating them as the output, uh, but just as a way to reach impact because that's what we're trying to do ultimately and avoiding that autopilot effect because we're never just designing uh, the thing, uh, but we're always designing our discipline as well. So let's be adventurous. All right. Shall we have Charlie and Katie uh, continue and add on this? Thank you. Um, so I can share our screen and yeah, thank you for that. That was um, super interesting. Um, and I'll just share my screen and then also just introduce myself and Katie. Great, okay, so um, yeah, I'm Charlie. Um, I'm a product manager at ID in UK. I'm really excited to be here and I'm excited to talk about this topic. Um, inclusive design is something I'm super passionate about and I've been working on our toolkit over the last, um, just over a year um, and just specifically how we can embed inclusive design into parts of the product process um, and looking forward to talking about one of our tools later on um, but I'll just hand over to Katie and Katie will intro herself and just get give a bit of a background on um, ideas perspective on inclusive design. Yes, hi everyone. So I'm Katie Wybird. I'm a director at IDEA in UK um, and I've been working on our inclusive design approach and method for several years now. So to elaborate slightly on the title then, so we're not designing for stereotypes, we're designing for people. Um, and our take on that would be, would be that we're designing for all people. Um, and that's what we aim to do by designing inclusively. So inclusive design to us is um, about how we design products and services that are accessible to and usable by as many people as humanly possible. So it's a movement that came around in the 70s 
off the back of the web accessibility standards that were set, but it's grown into something much, much bigger than that. And it's something that we practice now in all the projects that we undertake when we're designing new products and services or reinventing existing ones. So when we start talking about inclusive design, people typically think that it's about designing for people who have physical and mental impairments, of which there are many, and they should absolutely be factored into the design process. And we should be aiming to design products and services that uh, are more inclusive to for people who have those impairments. But uh, ideally we would argue that it goes way beyond that even, and that anyone can have any sort of temporary impairment at any time. Um, so that actually when you're looking at inclusive design, you're really designing for the majority and not the minority. And what we mean by a temporary impairment is that that could be something where you're drunk, um, you are um, sleep deprived because you're a new parent, you're on public transport listening to really loud music and you can't hear what's going on around you. There's so many different ways that impairments can temporarily manifest and that could therefore impact the experience that you have of a product and service. So, to, but to take it even one step further, we think that inclusive design is also about um, fostering a way for users to feel a sense of belonging and a sense of inclusion when they're experiencing a product and service. So it's actually quite, quite a big thing. It's all very encompassing and there's multiple layers to it. So um, this is something that we've brought into our practice and it's how we now approach our um, design work in the studio. And we have talked to clients about this. We've, um, and we started to realize that actually, this is something that is quite difficult to communicate into organizations when the people on the ground who are doing the designing um, don't have all the tools or aren't aware of how best to go about it. So actually we refocused um, our approach to working with designers and creating tools to enable them to practice more inclusive design. So start it, the change really kind of starts with us. And today, Charlie and I are gonna share two of the tools that we've developed and that we've been using to help bring more inclusive mindset to uh, design. So I'm going to show you now Cards for Humanity. So this is a tool that we developed a couple of years ago now. In the first instance, we did it in um, card form, which <laughs> we'd actually started talking about how we make it into um, an, a digital form before COVID took off. But then as soon as COVID was a thing, we very quickly realized that we needed to ex uh, accelerate that project. Um, and what it is, is it's a tool that not in any circumstances would it ever replace uh, research, um, but it's a way to bring a more inclusive perspective to the work that we're doing because it generates different uh, users or people and traits that you can have a look at, um, consider the different perspectives that that then brings and apply that to the work you're doing. So let me show you how it works and that's an easier way to describe it. So if you deal a set of cards, Charlie. Okay, so what we would do is we would you know, be designing a, uh, an experience um, and what we would want to do is, okay, think, look, we can generate um, one of these sets of cards and then that will give us a bit of a, a different perspective to consider. So in this instance, we've got uh, Lupu Bridget, who is 16 and is overly trusting. And then if you click on that card, Charlie, on the back, that will give you some considerations. So some people believe something that they've read or heard without question, or some people may not have access to, to know or know where to look for trustworthy sources. And then what we do is instead of just considering that in, on its own, this person also has an essential tremor. So how does that then affect the way that they interact with the particular products or service that you're designing. So it could mean that your their hand shakes a little bit, so it makes writing, using tools difficult, or um, it makes the digital user interface harder to use because it's um, cramped or they can't quite, it's too complex for them. So this tool just brings in a different perspective and you can generate so many of these um, based on the pack of cards that we have and we're always adding more to them. Um, and it just helps very quickly bring those 
different perspectives in and challenges any unconscious bias that you may have inadvertently not been aware of when designing. So that's our first tool. And then I'm gonna hand over to Charlie, who's gonna take us through our second tool, unless anyone's got any immediate questions around it, or we can go on to the next tool and then we can ask those at the end. There's just a lot of uh, uh, sort of a delight, uh, delightment uh, uh, in the chat. Sort of uh, people are just saying like love the cards and so forth, but no co uh, no questions at this moment. But please uh, please continue. Okay, okay great. Um, thanks, Katie. And just checking, you can see the universal score now on my screen. But that's swapped over. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Um, so just to yeah to talk to another tool now, but just to build slightly on what um, Kate was saying in terms of we we I guess as a part of our toolkit started with Cards for Humanity, which has been such a great tool to consider a far broader range of people than you would kind of ever be able to, and all of those combinations that Kate is talking about, and um, you kind of it would be unrealistic to be able to talk to that many participants or that many combinations of people, um, especially very early on in the process. Um, so it's great to kind of be able to think about all those different needs um, and, and design for those. What we found ourselves asking um, and where we kind of, um, the reason behind the universal score is, um, that's a really great kind of um, process and step in the right direction. But then what happens next? How do we make sure that um, the, I guess, we, we continue to prioritize um, all of those different needs and prioritize inclusive design all the way through the product process um, so that we can increase the chances of the, the product that we get out there and the product that goes to market that could go through a long kind of design and build or um, yeah, different kind of phases and that we can feel confident that we will be able to push a product through that funnel that actually does work for everyone. And those, those positive design intentions um, are carried on throughout the whole, um, the whole process. Um, and that's kind of where we land on and the reason behind creating the universal score. So um, it's a inclusion and belonging um, prioritization and, and evaluation framework um, is like the kind of official summary of it. Um, but essentially what it enables um, you to do is to just look at your product and service. And it could be that you're at a point where you have a journey or a blueprint or screen. So you're really kind of further along in the process um, and just evaluate it against a set of um, inclusivity um, criteria. Um, so it kind of enables you just to push beyond that target audience and beyond what might be defined and really consider um, all of those needs that we've talked about, but in a lot of kind of more detail in a practical way. Um, so I'll just quickly do a demo of the tool um, and just jump through the questions. So there's five different lenses that we we consider um, mental well-being, belonging, uh, physical needs, neurodiversity um, putting people first, which is around designing for vulnerable customers. And um, if you have a journey that you're kind of designing, the idea is that you would go through each of those sections and there's some specific provocations or questions um, for each of those um, areas to, to consider and then to give your journey um, or a prototype a score. Um, and so to use this one as an example, the question we'd ask ourselves is how easy is it for people to fix mistakes throughout this journey? And best practice would be giving people the option to review information, to update or to cancel um, at any point to reduce any anxiety of having made a mistake or doing something wrong. And you could give that um, a score, have a conversation. If there's any room for improvement, note down any kind of um, opportunities or iterations that you might want to take into the next round. Um, and you basically just go through this process um, for every question. So um, just going through these questions, kind of, I'll skip through them quite quickly so we can get to the end. Um, thinking about whether it's um, clear in terms of what's expected of people at each stage of the journey, um, how easy it is for people to know where they are in terms of the progress they've made, um, whether users can make decisions without feeling pressure for no reason. And then you go on through each section. So moving on to belonging and thinking about um, whether imagery is representative of all target users, um, whether the language is, is clear to all, so are we using colloquialisms and things like that? Um, have we considered different cultures and beliefs? And are we being sensitive if we're asking for information, um, allowing people to choose preferred pronouns, just making it clear how we're using that information? And then we go on to physical needs and thinking about um, whether people with um, visual, hearing, um, mobility impairments, whether they can all use access and really enjoy the experience in its entirety, and whether there's actually enough support provided throughout the experience in general. Um, 
And then moving on to diverse uh, neurodiversity, so thinking about different cognitive needs, um, is it people um, easy for people to um, uh, complete tasks if they've got a shorter attention span? Um, is it easy to kind of avoid making impulsive decisions? Have we got the right level of friction, particularly around financial products and um, any investments people might be making? Can you pick up where you've left off? Um, and is it easy to focus on the task at hand? And then lastly, a section around vulnerable um, customers and putting people first. So have we considered like life changes, things like loss of earnings, bereavement, how that impacts people who are going through the experience? Um, are users encouraged to make decisions in their best interest? Do users know where they stand? Um, and can they really make an informed decision? So that was a very quick step through all of them, but just to kind of get to this end point, we then just show the universal score. So in this instance, 61 out of 100, it's not bad, but there's probably a lot to do that could uplift the experience. Um, and then there's just a uh, option to look at the different scores for each of those sections to help you prioritize what you might want to focus on in the next iteration. Um, so in terms of kind of when we've used it with clients, it's really work best almost as a part of a cadence within a sprint or within um, a phase of a project so you can use the tool make changes test it with customers and then almost go back and see if those worked um and yeah that's kind of best best um i guess way of using it in a practical way so i'll just i'll stop there because i'm conscious we've probably already gone over time um, and just hand back over oh, that no worries thank you so much i i i promise to be the moderator and i'm sort of like uh, looked at the time uh, um, holistically, so it's all good. Uh, however, um, while people are loving your presentation and, and, and giving a lot of sort of a thumbs up for, for the cards and what you were just sharing, there was not, no questions. And since we are a tiny bit behind the schedule, I think we could just sort of jump right to the next presentation and sort of bundle up all the questions and, and everything uh, for a Q&A session and a conversation after the presentations. So thank you, Charlie. And uh, so Tina and Kirsi, are you ready? Yes. Uh, so um, yes. the next speakers are uh, from uh, City of Helsinki. Uh, which is the biggest employer in Finland and a huge investor in, in, um, in de design and service design. They just completed a, a hiring round of hiring uh, six new design, more designers to their team. And uh, um, they ha have a very, um, very modest goal of becoming the most functional city <laughs> in the world. So, and there is, uh, so, so they're here to uh, share about sort of examples of how, um, how they've sort of done inclusive design uh, in the city of Helsinki or for the um, inhabitants of Helsinki. So Tina Hahto and Kirsi Verka, please, stage is yours. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for your colleagues of your most inspiring presentations before us. And there is a lot to dive, dive in, in more too. It was really, really wonderful tools you were uh, sharing with us. Uh, so my name is Kirsi Verka, and I'm working as a development manager for Helsinki Participatory Budgeting. And uh, I'm telling you a little bit how we have been trying to tackle, tackle uh, the, the, the thing that, that uh, we should be designing equal and inclusive participation process. Um, uh, in Helsinki, we have made a, a participation model. Uh, that was quite extensive co-creation process with, with the citizens and after that process we have now three guiding principles that are really uh, leading and guiding all our participation work in, in Helsinki and the three principles you can see here uh, one is like utilizing know-how and expertise of individuals and communities and enabling uh, self-motivated motivated civic activity and then of course creating equal opportunities for participation and in our uh, in our project uh, uh, participatory budgeting we have been really concentrating on this to, to make the process as equal and inclusive as as possible this is already our second round we started uh, autumn 2018 so now we know a little bit better what we are doing but uh, the, the basic idea is that Helsinki City is uh, opening 8.8 .8 million euros of its own budget for citizens to ideate and vote how the city should spend, spend this money. Uh, and, and we have started now uh, earlier in the autumn uh, with the ideation phase and we got around like 1,500 idea ideas. And now during this spring, we have been uh, co-creating those ideas in the, in the proposals. 
and then next uh, autumn we're going to vote for those proposals so at, at the moment we have like 500 uh, proposals on our platform and this whole process is completely digital so so people are giving the ideas to our digital platform the co-creation is also digital and we're also voting in a, in a digital platform which is called oma study oma, oma study is a finnish uh, finnish word which which means like my city my town so uh, I really like this uh, Nesta's uh, way of, of, of thinking uh, what makes a good digital democracy process, because I think it would be very easy for us just to concentrate on our on our tool. We're using uh, Desidim, uh, which is an open source platform developed in, in Barcelona. And you can use Desidim for all sorts of participation things, but we're using it for the participatory budgeting. And it would be very easy for us just to concentrate on the on the on the on the platform. But for us, uh, the, the main thing has been really to, to support the participation of, of the citizens. And here I'm going to give you some examples how we have been doing this. I can say that we have been designing, we have been planning, and then sometimes we have been just surviving. So, uh, so it has been a mixture of all kinds of, uh, which is I think it's very uh, typical for public public sector how you're how you're um, developing your processes. But of course, we have also wanted to, to know and learn a lot about, about our citizens and the people we are, we are making, making the process for. So we have made a lot of inquiries, we are collecting a lot of feedback, we have held a lot of workshops for both the city experts and also workshops together with the citizens and, and city experts. And we, we are also having a, a longer design jam when we started. And then we have had also quite extensive uh, research uh, cooperation with with Helsinki University and um, other um, research uh, programs uh, projects. Uh, but of course, we have also made our uh, participation profiles. Uh, it has been very important for us to understand what motiv motivates uh, people to to participate. I think it's uh, very common and easy also to start to uh, develop a participation um, process for those self-confident. They are the ones that self somehow automatically comes to, to our minds because they are the ones, they, they're the ones who are active. We often, most often hear their voices and they, they are the ones that are getting heard. Um, but, but we have uh, several types of uh, uh, motivations and, and this is, uh, this is uh, something that has really helped us in, in, in all the way when we have been planning, for example, the marketing material, or we have been developing our platform or when we have been developing our workshops or other events. So this is, uh, this is something that has been very helpful, helpful for us. So we can see that people are also just randomly participating or they're the ones who are really committed. Or then we are, we know that we have the ones who are really acting. And then we have the ones who are really experiencing, I'm, I'm participating. They're not really maybe doing anything, but it, it's the feeling of, of, uh, of uh, participation. And that is as important, I think, uh, participation is also a feeling. Uh, then, of course, uh, Helsinki City is uh, providing a lot of services for, for, for the citizens. So we have been doing also a close uh, cooperation. We have been doing a close cooperation with the different services of, of the city uh, so that we could reach reach out the people who are maybe not so easily easily to, to reach or who are maybe not the, the ones who are the most often uh, participating in different participation processes that the Helsinki City is, is providing for the, for the citizens. And, and especially a uh, fruitful um, uh, cooperation we have had with, uh, with, uh, with the base, basic education and vocational education. Uh, we could say that uh, almost 40% of the uh, 11 or 15 year old um, uh, uh, young people were voting in, in, in the first round of, of OMA study. So that was really um, wonderful, wonderful cooperation for us. Uh, but then it has been also important for us to create tools that would uh, that would make uh, people um, understand this quite complex process. It takes uh, two years time. It's a digital process. Uh, city planning is not easy. 
now when we are in the middle of the co-creation, I can tell you it's really complex and difficult. Uh, and and so so we have now created this this game. Uh, it's the um, card game for people uh, people to ideate to make ideas for the participatory budgeting. And at the same time, it's also um, helping people to understand more about the whole process and what what is going to happen next and and how they how they can then follow us and participate throughout the whole whole process. My uh, my dream and my idea is that we would develop this uh, kit of cards uh, in a way that it would be um, uh, this kind of a helpful tool throughout the whole process so that it would also help when we have this co-creation and also when they start to make um, make me may, maybe uh, their own marketing material or campaigns for the for the for the voting voting time so, but this is this is for the further further development of, of the game and then of course uh, we have uh, also uh, organized uh, this kind of face-to-face -face meetings this photo of course is from our first round when we could really meet people and we had a cup of coffee and we had a room full of laughter and uh, discussions and uh, chatting and hugging. So it has been very different for us this year when we have been now organizing 10 different um, workshops, which are di digital. And I, I can say that we have been surviving this, but it hasn't been as, as energizing and, um, and, and, and interesting as, as, the, as the first round when really had the face-to-face -face -face meetings. But we have been able to do, of course, the co-creation. The, the thing was that the, the citizens and the civil servants would meet in these co-creation workshops and then really dig down to the, to the proposals and, um, and develop them, them, them together further on. So this is a short, short glimpse to what we have been doing here in, in Helsinki to, to, to make our uh, participatory budgeting process uh, as inclusive and, and um, equal as, as possible. Of course, we have done several other, other things as well, but maybe this is most interesting for you from, from the designer's uh, perspective. And now my colleague Tina Harto is going to continue. This is a, a full speed presentation. <laughs> so uh, please, Tina. Thank you, yours. Kirsi. Thank you, Kirsi. So uh, my name is Tina Hahto and I come from the social services and healthcare sector in city of Helsinki. And actually I'm sitting there in the procurement services. And today I'm going to tell you about what is the role of inclusive design in procurement process. And I'm especially going to focus on uh, the procurement process of housing services for people with disabilities. So the um, city of Helsinki is one of Finland's largest buyers of products and services. And the procurement of products and services from the private sector exceeds 2 billion euros per year. And this uh, includes all the sectors, but uh, social and healthcare sector is a big one of this. Next one. Can you guess about the next one? Thank you. And uh, for this procurement process, traditionally, um, customer is not that well heard in the process, but we have designed an analysis framework for getting overview of the service and its quality uh, called make or buy analysis or analysis, those of you who speak Finnish. And this analysis is a tool for strategic decision making and helping and it helps in creating the criteria for the procurement. And in the end, the analysis gives recommendations for developing the services further. And uh, by taking the customer voice into consideration when we do this analysis, analysis and therefore also in the procurement process, we are able to ensure that the quality of the services we buy match the needs, needs and wishes of the end customers and also match the services that we ourselves produce in the city of Helsinki. And more about what is the inclusive design's role in our analysis next. So, um, as you may might know, many customers of social and healthcare services are in a vulnerable state. They might not be able to communicate properly, or they might have like physical or um, some mental uh, restraints. And at the same time, often those these services are a major part of their day-to-day -day lives. They might uh, live in a housing unit, or they might uh, go to a substance abuse center daily. Uh, so therefore, uh, these services have a huge part of their uh, everyday lives. 
and uh, to take their experiences into consideration and uh, using inclusive design is very much needed. And uh, this was the case also in the procurement process of housing services for people with disabilities that we did in 2018 uh, until 2019. So uh, a little bit some uh, background info. What is the housing service for people with disabilities? Uh, in the city of Helsinki, around 400 customers live in housing units uh, where they get service and they also the housing from the city because they have some kind of disability. Uh, it might be uh, mental or physical or uh, some kind of injury or disease uh, based uh, disability. Uh, but basically they are usually severely uh, disabled. And this uh, service costs for the city around uh, 20 million euros per year. So it's a quite costly service, of course, because it's a housing service. And uh, around 90% of this uh, service is provided by private sector that city of Helsinki buys. So uh, how we approached uh, this uh, procurement process in more inclusive way. Uh, first of all, we started with uh, the background, gathering the background info. Uh, we interviewed experts from City of Helsinki and different organizations that represent uh, disabled people. And then we organized customer workshops uh, where there were open questions about housing and their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, we also organized a workshop for service providers where we discussed the uh, quality elements of the service. Then this was followed by design, or you might call those also uh, cultural ropes that were sent to uh, these. These were sent to uh, customers' homes where they filled those, uh, maybe together with their personal assistant or uh, loved ones. And these assignments evolved around what is good or bad service, uh, what customers wish for their apartments, what is their social habitat made of, so or the basic things about their lives and uh, housing. Uh, then after this, uh, uh, these results were reviewed and, and the main insights were gathered and these were then validated in workshops in housing units in uh, later in uh, spring. And uh, those workshops were organized in housing units and besides that also those who couldn't attend those workshops, an uh, online survey was sent to them via Facebook, their uh, Facebook group. And in these assignments, in these uh, workshops, these workshops, uh, customers reflected what kind of elements uh, build good service and housing. And this then continued the, the last phase where we used a uh, customer jury uh, made out of, uh, I think there are four or five uh, customers who uh, went more deeply into what kind of elements could be brought into the actual procurement and competitive tendering process. And there were two planning sessions. And besides that, they also took part in the workshop that was organized for service providers, more uh, detailed one about the actual uh, competitive tendering. And uh, what were the results from uh, this, all of this process? Uh, the insights were uh, formed into two kind of visualizations. Uh, first one was pyramid of service quality, which, can see when, which you can see in the bottom half, the things that need to be met in order that the service is even good. So this was, for example, respectful meeting and fluency. And uh, then after these, uh, if these are well, uh, handle it, uh, flexibility and individuality come, uh, come to, into play. And also uh, there's a question mark about how can we exceed the expectations? How can we even uh, um, provide even better service for the customers? Then there's this circle of good housing that shows what kind of elements are important for the customers. And uh, apartment needs to of course have a good space and uh, all the features and it needs to be accessible, but also it needs to feel like a home. It needs to be, it needs to be personal, safe and cozy. And also the location and environment, of course, play a big part. Uh, is there, for example, their family or friends living nearby or are they somewhere far away from them? Or what is the, is there nature or is there city uh, services nearby? Those play a big role. Then uh, from all of these, those were the main insights, the pyramid and the circle. And these were uh, brought into the service description and service criteria that is used uh, in the competitive tendering and in the procurement process. 
and also the actual documents that used to be uh, quite um, maybe tedious and a uh, list of only uh, chapters, <laughs> maybe 30 pages or so, was made more tool-like and visual and uh, also more nice to look at from the point of view of customers, their loved ones, service providers, employees. This is the base of the service. It describes what is the serv service is like. Then also we suggested that the customer and employee satisfaction would be uh, regularly uh, measured uh, during the um, uh, the time of the service. That is, it's four years usually at the time when the service is procured. And then also we just suggested that the customer jury would be used regularly during the contract period. And also the co-creation with the service providers would uh, continue during the uh, contract period. So that was uh, shortly uh, this case of housing for ser uh, housing services for disabled people. But besides this, we have also done uh, other projects. Uh, for example, uh, about substance abuse services, uh, housing services for elderly people, homeless people, uh, home care services, and work and day activities for disabled people. And some of these have had a uh, procurement process besides uh, the analysis, but some have also had a strategic purpose why we have done the analysis. So that's shortly uh, my turn. Uh, maybe now for the uh, questions. Well, thank you so much, uh, Tina and and Kirsi and and the, the, I mean, thank you basically to all our presenters at this point because uh, we've we've gone through an uh, amazing amount of information about inclusive design and uh, how to sort of a take uh, take into consideration different different user needs and really not focus on uh, stereotypes but actual human beings. So. Um, and and I just sort of a, a comment on this, uh, the last last part, uh, which is uh, yours, Dina, is, is that uh, this just goes to show that uh, design can be used everywhere, and and how we're talking about procurement processes, and um, isn't it so that it's one of the um, sort of a pilot areas uh, at the city of Helsinki where you, uh, they've had uh, designers for quite some time. Uh, yes, I think no other city uses this kind of approach in their procurement process. So we have been the first ones to apply this uh, analysis framework. And actually, I'm an only designer at the moment. We have another one who is on uh, their family leave at the moment. Uh, but we are kind of like doing this on our own, of course, with uh, some consultants uh, sometimes. But it's a very much a process we have created ourselves here in the city of Helsinki. Well, thank you uh, to all presenters. And um, so we're moving to the second part of the evening, which is um, sort of a conversation and a Q&A session with all of our speakers. Uh, do we have, well, basically, I, I would I want to invite as many of you as possible to um, put your video, I mean, turn on your video and um, come and join us um, for a face-to-face -face session. We, I think we sit so often uh, in front of a computer and just uh, look at different presentations. It's uh, great to see you all. And uh, as much as our um, Wi-Fi network allows. Um, for some reason, I mean, it's it's. I love seeing you, Tina, all all there uh, on the main screen. But for some reason, you're you're the only one who is visible uh, on the main main screen. Um, do we have a way of 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 bringing the other speakers uh, in as well, or is it more of a way I choose to? Yeah, it's me. Yeah, it's the gallery view. Sorry about that one. That was just one of those moments. <laughs> um. Now, this would be a perfect moment uh, for any of you to ask questions. And uh, we have the uh, hand, uh, like a, a way of sort of, uh, uh, you, if you want to sort of react and sort of uh, ask a, a question in person, that can be done as well. But um, 
we have uh, compiled some questions uh, for different presenters, and I think uh, this could become a more of a conversation as well. So if, if this is directed to uh, some of you, please uh, feel free to sort of uh, chime in and sort of uh, share your experiences and so forth. So thank you. Uh, there's, there's a lot of comments uh, also in the chat thanking you all. Uh, but um, to perhaps to start uh, with, um, the um, first two presentations uh, regarding sort of uh, inclusive toolkits. And um, with the idea and toolkits, they were clearly online, right? They, they are something that is accessible for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, perhaps uh, while, while there are many ways of sharing this information, one of them could be that could you just sort of a copy paste the, uh, the addresses to our chat so people can sort of uh, copy it from there for their own use and uh, visit the sites um, even after this presentation. How about with the Design It Toolkit? Is that something that is available for others or is it something that you only use um, in your own uh, agency work? Julia or Chiara? Um, yeah, uh, so kind of a, the, it is the, the process that we went through and the um, thinking around mindsets uh, is absolutely available to everyone. We have, uh, we have written kind of a quite long article and there's a, a microsite that collects some resources, we have done uh, other talks about it and the presentation for it is uh, like, there's a video online recorded of another presentation a bit more extensive that we have done. And, um, and also our, the slides or a more complete, a comprehensive set of the slides that you have seen today is on a public Miro board. So I can send some links uh, around that. Um, but like Julia has uh, said by uh, towards the end of our uh, brief presentation, we don't really have, Mindset is not a defined uh, process, it's not a tool per se, like we looked up the definition of tool and it doesn't necessarily fit the definition of, uh, of a tool because it's not that prescriptive, it's, uh, it's more like a way or an invitation of uh, things that you should consider when um, talking about users and segmenting users or uh, trying to group and make sense of the research uh, that you have conducted. I don't know if you want to add something about that, Julia. I think you, you explained many things. I just, maybe the only thing that I would like to add is that we've run a couple of uh, design it events and off the back of those, we've also set up some more one-to-one. -one. And I think for us to kind of have a 20 minutes conversation with someone to understand more specifically what's the context uh, of the organization, of the sector, the research maturity as well of the organization. They're all key aspects to really understand how to, um, kind of anchor uh, the tool. Having said that, not every project requires mindsets. It's not that we're around saying minds like with a flag with written mindset on it. Uh, there are a ton of other tools. It's a matter of understanding if it's the right match. So yeah. please, like, please feel free to get in touch with us and we can have more thorough conversations to understand the specific needs. Yeah. It was quite interesting, actually, uh, uh, now, now to sort of uh, uh, summing up all the, like, I consider, like, while, while um, you were all sort of uh, speaking um, during the same slot, I think that there were, there were sort of, a, it's almost like two different pre presentations of, of a similar sort of a topic. And then there's the city of Helsinki, who also ha happened to have like a, a, a sort of a set of cards to play with uh, in a different situation. Uh, Kirsi, uh, can you sort of uh, elaborate a little more on those cards and, um, and there, as you said, you know, like it's something that you've been developing and so forth. And uh, are they, um, are they use specific? Are they for the budgeting or are, are you, have you sort of developed them into for, for something more generic use as well? No, this is something that we have developed just for, for our participatory budgeting process. 
And while we were developing it, of course, we were testing it with several different uh, different kinds of groups, like young people, elderly people, immigrants, and so on and so on. And all the time, we get the feedback of how to how to improve it. We have it in uh, in um, four different languages. We have it in in Finnish. We have it in simple Finnish. We have it in English, and we have it in in Swedish. Uh, so we have been organizing this kind of um, play events, uh, so that we have been gathering people together, a group of people, and then we have been playing the cards. Uh, the card game uh, when we have been ideating uh, ideas for the participatory budgeting it has been also a great um, seat, <laughs> a great cute uh, marketing tool for us uh, it's a really nice giveaway for all the organizations we are working with or also with all the uh, services city services we are working with uh, so that they can also use it when they are uh, playing together with, them, with their own group of people yeah. So this is the way we have been using it. This is, uh, I'll start with you with the question and I'll iterate it a little bit for uh, for Design It and IDN um, gang. Um, how has this uh, way of thinking been uh, received uh, within uh, your sort of within the city, within your external stakeholders and so forth? Is this something that, um, is is widely understood the the need for uh, diversity, the need for sort of uh, inclusion, and 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 the fact that uh, you as designers are the advocates of of this approach. Is it is it a smooth sailing, or or how do you how would you describe it? Should I start? Uh, I you and Tina, please. <laughs> yes, yeah, yes. But this is a question we often get from the politicians. They are very interested in, in, in to know about this. But also, um, so 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 it is something that it is uh, it is um, as I said, it's it's one of the princi principles in in our participation model. Also, so it is something that we really have to take take into consideration. And we have been working a lot with that. There were some questions, for example, how do we work with that with a older people so we have been having this kind of um, voting uh, we have been helping them with uh, with the voting in the, in the elder houses and we have been helping them with the ideation in the elderly houses and we have been working with them with the uh, services with for the elder people uh, then we have been also uh, making a very a good cooperation with with several um, uh, organizations that are working with the, with the immigrants and this autumn for example they were organizing maybe like 200 workshops for their own uh, for their own um, people and maybe we got like 100 ideas from from those uh, those workshops that we are now developing into proposals so we have been trying to find um several different ways ways to to reach uh, reach people and then of course we have had also we people have also got information in all the libraries about the OMA study and they have got the help for for voting from all the libraries and also from the community houses and so on and so on so even though this is a digital uh, process we have been trying to see that that you get also this kind of face-to-face -face help and, and we have in, in, in several services yeah. people people can help you with with the OMA study. Tina do you want to add something? Uh, can you repeat the question in a nutshell? <laughs> it, it, yeah, it was just really like, how has this been received? You know, are you getting a lot of support within the uh, city of Helsinki, or is it like, has it been very sort of smooth sailing, or is this something mm -hmm. that you still need to um, go through a, quite a lot of effort and selling to uh, sh share this way of sort of uh, designing and, and and this approach? At first, it was uh, not a smooth sailing, but um, nowadays it's actually approved by our uh, director of our sector, so social and health services sector. So it's an, we have actually a plan for the next two years, how we're going to proceed and what kind of services we're going to look more into. So it's kind of already part of the strategic process in our sector nowadays. And also, uh, we usually always present our uh, final reports uh, to uh, the board of social and health services sector. So political uh, leaders who have been chosen uh, by the citizens and they uh, always ask tricky questions, but are always happy to hear what is what does the service look like at the moment and what are, for example, the quality elements of the service we are more looking into in that specific project. Thank you. We have a raised hand there, so please. Yes, I just wanted to, to add to this that it has been quite uh, easy and um, uh, 
um, widely accepted that of course we are trying to help people in, in many ways to participate, but which is not so easy to for the for the city itself, uh, for the divisions and organization itself to get this immense uh, feedback we get from the citizens. We got 1,500 ideas and now we have 500 proposals that people are willing to do and they want that the, the city is doing and that is not an easy easy thing that suddenly we get so much feedback from the citizens that we should react and we should uh, co-create proposals with them and this hasn't been so a smooth sailing if I could say that. <laughs> Thank you for, for that sort of a a specific sort of a point there. Uh, for the uh, design and idea and presentations, um, the question, similar question in a way is that you've developed these uh, methods and these, these tools for, uh, have you just developed them for specific projects and how, has, how are the clients responding? Is this something that most are aware of and uh, most are already taking into consider is it consideration or, or is it something that you need to bring up and make sure that it's uh, sort of a, it's taken care of or sort of a, be a part of the design process? Who's going to go first? Uh, should we go, go ahead? Go ahead, Katie. Yeah, so we um, started by developing Cards for Humanity when we realized that we needed a way of bringing a more inclusive uh, perspective into the work that we were doing. So <clears throat> that came about to help us deliver our projects better um, whilst <clears throat> demonstrating to our clients that it's not a big shift that is required to design more inclusively. Because I think when we start well, originally when we started to talk about it, and this is, it's been a real journey for us in terms of how we best communicate this as a concept so that clients are receptive to it, is that it feels very overwhelming to start off with, because if you're talking about really being inclusive, you need to be um, considering race, age, gender, religion, literacy, neurodiversity, connectivity, the, the list is so long that it's just too much. So we had to look at a way to make um, a step which was very accessible for everybody and quite simple to include to kind of manage that kind of sense of how overwhelming it could feel so um, that's how the tool came about and we're constantly iterating on it and developing the descriptions and the traits and the characters because the first time around as with anything as we design things that go through multiple iterations so the first version that you'll have seen that we had was very different to what it looks like now um, and, we, and we wanted to be deliberately very open about it. it's not something we're protective of we want everyone to design inclusively so we share it with everybody as so that's why we love talking to people about it because hopefully everyone here today will then think oh this is quite good and then share it with more people it got shared yesterday on a design site um, a design inspiration site and we got 5,000 hits in a day which is brilliant it was very exciting for us um, but um, <clears throat> so yeah we want to speak you know to anyone to spread the word really um, and from a project perspective it's probably best if Charlie speaks about that and uh, how we're putting inclusive design leads on every project so every project is designed um, or has an inclusive perspective on it yeah, I think that's the other thing. And just to kind of build on what you're saying, one of, um, I think, so there's two things in terms of, I guess, the openness of clients to use some of these tools. And then also just internally as a studio, how do we make sure that we're adopting them and using them as a part of the process as well, which I think is like both things almost we have to consider. Um, and, and one of the ways in terms of as a studio that I guess we thought about it is having by having an inclusive design lead um, as an example, then you've got someone kind of champion, championing it within the team. Um, and it's almost that kind of first step, um, because what should be happening is they shouldn't even necessarily be um, specific inclusive design tools. All of the tools that we use should just be inclusive by default but there's almost that gap between the now and then getting and then getting to that point and I think that's definitely what we've learned with clients is this if we kind of just plan to use this framework as a part of on a project with the team in the same way they wouldn't necessarily kind of um, challenge using an opportunity canvas or you know a research brief if, if it's just a part of the process 
there isn't really a question on it. I think it's more about talking it as a, as a bigger kind of concept. And that's when sometimes it can get deprioritized or kind of left right to the end. Um, if it's just really a part of this is the toolkit we we use and we've always had a toolkit, it's just kind of like making it a part of the day to day. It becomes much more, I guess, manageable and much more just a part of our current process versus something that's, that's separate, um, I think. And even for every proposal now that we send out, <clears throat> we have a, <coughs> no, <coughs> bit of a frog there. We have a check, you know, that has the inclusive element of this being considered so that it's in the conversation right from the very outset. Right. And this, um, this is um, in the UK and just sort of putting things into perspective because, you know, like of, oftentimes, if not so well, for, unfortunate for us, rest of the rest of uh, us is that, you know, like UK is in forefront of these things much more than perhaps sort of uh, some other countries where these conversations are maybe still sort of uh, to come. Uh, so it would be really interesting to hear the um, Norwegian perspective is that uh, is this is this something that the clients already sort of um, start talking about themselves? or is it something that you have to bring up and uh, or do you include it in all projects where where are you guys regarding inclusive design or more yes. our my, yeah <clears throat> I mean I think from the Norwegian I can I can speak maybe for from a design perspective first just because we well I am the inclusion diversity equity and inclusion champion for design it um, and Design It has been started doing a big, big uh, work uh, in terms of understanding how to bring this uh, uh, approach um, to kind of really reflect on us as designers first, uh, and then to look into the type of uh, practices that we do and tools that we use, uh, but also to understand how to implement it in our organization. Um, as a whole, like in the way that we recruit people, in the language that we use, in the type of, uh, you know, proposal that we accept, uh, in the type of, uh, uh, you know, who our leaders are and, and, and along all these lines. Um, but I think that um, personally, I've been working maybe with a couple of uh, uh, main Norwegian clients and uh, we are starting the conversation and I think it's very much uh, at, the, at the beginning, but there is a lot of, uh, there is a lot of um, um, intentionality in wanting to do better. Um, I would say because of the, but please uh, other Norwegians, because I'm Italian, so, and I moved here recently, so if any Norwegian disagrees with me, um, I think that there is a little bit more attention towards the gender aspect rather than all the other um, aspects that have been uh, uh, discussed uh, also by, by Katie and Charlie. Um, so there, the, it's at the beginning and there's a, there's a lot of potential, a lot of opportunity. Does anyone uh, from Norway who were you guys were sort of nodding there? I noticed. So do you do you guys want to elaborate on this uh, from a point of view of of uh, you you've seen it for a, a, the development for a longer period of time? Perhaps I mean Ule there or uh, sorry to put you on a spot, but I just saw you nodding there. <laughs> I love to be put on the spot. This is great. Um, yeah, no, I think. Um, um, I think the thing that uh, Julia is pointing out about that we often talk about, uh, you know, gender equality, we talk about these issues, but then there's a lot of other issues that um, maybe aren't lifted because often uh, for the for the clients or for the organization, they, they might not be at the forefront of their the issue they're tackling right now. Uh, so in dealing with um, one issue, um, bringing in the kind of diversity aspect of, okay, how do we solve that with all these different mindsets in, in um, considering it from different angles, I think is, uh, is something that uh, the market in Norway definitely is starting to do. But I think the, the things that we've seen here today uh, kind of exemplifies that there is so much opportunity to do this in a, in a better way and in a, in a more integrated way. Yeah. So I'm just thumbs up, nodding, this is yeah. and that's that's the, one of the reasons why uh, after uh, conversations with uh, our Norwegian colleagues, we uh, here in Finland realized that, that what we sort of found, came to the same sort of realization that we uh, there's been a lot of talk about sort of uh, responsibility from sort of uh, like um, from an 
ecological point of view or economic point of view, but this sort of a social responsibility aspect is something that is on the rise, but uh, we haven't sort of uh, um, had as many conversations about it. I'm also thinking that um, there, some of you might have questions that you want to ask. I know Elisa has been writing like a uh, lots of questions and perhaps you want to um, uh, say, ask one of them yourself. Equally, um, perhaps, um, uh, the IDN and Design It uh, gang has, might have uh, questions to ask from the city of Helsinki designers. So feel free to sort of uh, uh, also also just sort of uh, um, express those those uh, questions or or any musings that you have uh, regarding each other's presentations. But Elisa, perhaps if you want to ask something. Uh, thank you, Ola. I think you already covered all my questions. I've been listing them to you to the document. It's great to have you so so many here. Um, yeah, I was wondering, like, is there anyone here in among us who's been using some kind of tool that we haven't been talking here about? For the same kind of uh, ideas, idea and design it presented us. Sounds, yeah, sounds crickets. like when I'm having my daily meetings. <laughs> silent. If there is any hidden knowledge among us, it would be nice to bring it to surface. Yeah, feel free to also comment uh, in the chat. But it's definitely something. It's a, it's a topic that we have specialists in it, and then uh, then there are projects that uh, are very sort of uh, and 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 areas in which uh, people are very sort of aware of it. And, and some of us mere, like our mere, mere service designers are still sort of trying to grasp what it would mean and uh, what to take into consideration. Uh, I myself sort of realized as well that in, in some ways this, this idea of inclusivity, inclusivity um, allows us all to be a little bit more vulnerable with our own sort of uh, um, even the things that we uh, we've grown to consider flaws, for example, I ha I'm I'm half deaf. My left ear is completely deaf. I, I I'm dyslexic, and 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 those are things that I've sort of uh, always considered that I should hide. But I realized that those are actually, in a way, my superpowers. When I'm looking at uh, a sort of a designed uh, sort of a prototypes or something, and, and if I'm if if the lines of the text start jumping. Yes, it's me because I I I'm uh, I ha I have impaired I'm impaired in that area. But at the same time, uh, things should be designed in a way that it would be accessible for me, but it would be accessible uh, then accessible for multiple other uh, sort of uh, people with I mean hard, I mean difficulty of seeing and so forth. So so I just some, something of a, of a, to uh, to come to realize that this this also allows us to be present in much more human way when we take into, into consideration people as uh, uh, with the, all their sort of a human needs and not just sort of a stereotypes of representing like a, I'm a middle-aged mom with a teenage kid sort of a thing. Uh, Elisa, you, point, you wanted to you, uh, ask something else? Yeah, I'd like to know from uh, the presenters, like, what do you think is the next thing that you will develop? What can we wait? <laughs> Who wants to start? IDN, <laughs> Design it or Helsinki? I can, we can maybe start. Um, there's probably lots of tools and frameworks and things that we would love to create. I think one that we're really thinking about at the moment or talking about, and I don't know if in, if this is, um, I suppose, even a, a tool in the, in the way that the other tools are, um, but I think something that we've definitely identified as a really good opportunity is um, I think looking at our own research practices um, and thinking more about the research briefs and screeners etc that we use um, I think what's great about Cards Humanity and the Universal Score is you think about all of the different users and you try and yeah empathize with different needs and then really the next step is or has to be that you actually are able to talk to as many of those users as possible um, and so for us I think having a um, like a almost a more inclusive research screener which again should just be like the default screener that we use or the default brief but almost thinking about if we were to design the most inclusive research brief ever how would that 
what would that look like? And then how do we kind of track and, and measure? Is there a tool that enables us to kind of measure as we're um, speaking to people to almost like keep across um, how many we spoke, how many people we've spoken to that represent those needs? Um, so we can really be accountable through the whole process, particularly if we're speaking to like a, a vast number of participants that we can really start to track and make sure that we're being I mean, as inclusive as possible. That's definitely one like for me that I'm really passionate about and I, I'm like wanting us to kind of get to. Um, and Katie, I'm not sure if yeah, there's others, I'm sure, as well. Yeah, I think that is the main one that we the, the current one in discussion in the studio. I think what we're doing is as we're going along and evolving our thinking of this, we're finding more and more things until we can get to the end to end process uh, and make sure it's as inclusive as possible. So once we've got the screener, how can we make sure that actually the research that we're doing when we're testing prototypes, that as that process itself, not just the design, but how do we then structure those questions how do we do all of that so what the screener is right then how do we design the actual research so it's a continued step by step by step the um, process that we're going through maybe i can jump in a second because it really aligns with what charlie and katie were talking about and maybe i'll take a step earlier than that which is how we how we look at recruitment, because I think that, as I was pointing out in the uh, in the presentation that Karen and I did, recruitment is a very undervalued. It's always thought as very long and complicated, and uh, you know, like in in projects, is the is the time that it gets squeezed. Uh, but I think that if at that point we're able to. Um, recruit all the different perspectives that we need, that we Im embed those perspectives from the very start. Um, and I think uh, something else that we're also working on within the Design in Oslo specifically, specifically is a do no harm approach. Uh, so uh, learning from the anthropology, uh, anthrop oh my God, humanitarian <laughs> and, uh, you know, um, healthcare um, sectors how can us as designers be more mindful about how, well, the, the, the kind of the impact of our solutions, but also because we are doing much more participatory design and we are being more inclusive, how can we be more mindful about how we include users throughout the process in a way that is not harming for them? And uh, because it's it kind of like, it's always, we're always positive about it, right? Like we include users, we are designing with rather than designing for, but we also have to remember the type of dynamics that is, uh, that is always set up between designers and users and kind of to maintain uh, a do no harm approach throughout. Yeah, thank you. Uh, one final question to the city of Helsinki, uh, uh, Tina and Kirsi. Um, where do you look for inspiration and um, where do you look for guidance in, 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 in designing inclusive city? I mean, uh, in Finland, there aren't, you're in the forefront. In the, in the world, I'm sure you have uh, reference points and, 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 and people you look, into, uh, look, look up to possibly, not people, but cities you look up to, but where do you find the food for thought to, to continue doing the work that you do? Well, that's a difficult <laughs> question, but um, I guess for me, I try to look at different methods that other designers use, uh, of course, try to follow the discussion around uh, inclusive design. And then also, uh, as I um, commented on that chat, uh, we also, we design, uh, our, like our process is uh, very much based on the communication with the actual service that provides uh, the service for the customers. So uh, we do a lot of discussion with them and kind of talk about what is the customer group, what are their like needs and what are their pain points or already before we participate and do this uh, co-creation. So I don't know, maybe from that, like from experts, they know best uh, what kind of tools might not, might not be useful and what are not because they might have like 20 years of experience working as a social worker with disabled people. So they have tried many tools also during those times when they have worked uh, in uh, with disabled people. So that maybe is one thing. Thank you. Well, 
it would be lovely to continue this conversation. There's so many questions to ask and, and so forth. But I, I invite you all to sort of connect with each other after this uh, uh, meeting as well. And uh, uh, basically just sort of uh, share ideas and inspiration. Uh, it was lovely spending the, uh, the one and a half hours with you guys tonight talking about these very important issues. So. Um, I think we learned a lot today and uh, those of uh, us who are not applying these methods yet, we now have lots of links in the chat and so forth. Please make sure that you copy them for your own personal library. And Deja, do you want to sort of uh, wrap up everything? <laughs> thank you. Uh, well, a lot of thank yous in, in this point, I think. Um, uh, first of all, a big thank you to our speakers here. Uh, it was such a thrill to sort of hear this conversation and, and all these active comments and, and, and questions. Um, also, again, a big thank you to our organizers, Team Norway, Idun Kamilla, Ole Ranhild, thank you. And also to our fi Finnish team, uh, Lotta, Elli, Tero, Tarja, Jaakko, Lydia, Tarja, Riina, Tero and Ulla, of course. We had a big team behind this. Uh, also, I saw some, some familiar names from our uh, Service Design Net Network HQ in the, in the audience. Get, great to have you here as well with us. And uh, of course, the special biggest thank you goes to our audience. Lovely to have you here. here and, and looks like it that uh, enjoying the, the conversation as well as, as I did. Um, I'm not going to go, go on uh, much longer since we are running out of time, but a big thank you for everyone and uh, I hope to see you in our future events and maybe before you go you might want to uh, leave us a, a sort of feedback with an emoji in the in the comment box if you if you'd like to that would be really nice but from my behalf thank you everyone it, it was great to have you here on board. And the recording of this event will be found at the SDN uh, YouTube channel later on for everyone yeah. to see. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> have a good night. Bye. Thanks for having us. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.